So, yeah, so I'm from down the mountain uh, in Brevard College, and I actually lived way out on the west side of Brevard. We were in the section that really got hit by uh, Irma when all that came through, and I was without power for a couple of days. So I could imagine what all these poor people were going through elsewhere in the United States with power outages, and glad that mine only lasted two days. But the people who were in Brevard had no sympathy at all because they, I mean, their lights like blinked once. That was all that happened. So, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the diversity of the region. That's really what my specialty is: is in looking at these different the different types of diversity that we have, and also why we have such diversity here in the Southern Appalachians. So I know that many of you, when you go out and go hiking, love to look at wildflowers, right? Spring wildflowers in particular seem to be what bring people out and get them in, engaged and interacting with nature. I just picked out a few of my favorite ones that had uh, neat stories about them the various different kinds of trillium. We have several, several different types of trillium around in the region, and they're really that spring wildflower exemplar. Oconee bells, of course, are in relatively few counties, but they've transplanted very well. And now you find them in different regions where botanists rescued them in the 1950s, moved them to different locations, many of them through Transylvania County that I'm aware of, and they've taken off and done well. So it's an, an interesting story to me that here's a Coney Bells naturally occurs in only five counties in the world, Transylvania County where I'm from being one and then the surrounding areas as well. Yet it's hardy enough that when it is transplanted out, it does well. And I talked to some of our, um, our fish and wildlife people and said, why isn't this a listed plant? You know, it occurs in five counties. Why isn't that listed as endangered? And she said, yeah, you plant the thing anywhere, it just grows like crazy. You know, there's no reason for that to be listed. So it's interesting to me that we have these, these endemic species that are so closely tied to the mountains, and, and yet they have the capacity to expand beyond that. And then I just can't resist hearts of busting. That's something that's not really a spring wildflower, that's a uh, the seeds of a plant now, sometimes called strawberry bush, uh, but I like hearts of busting because it really does look like that's opening up. And just these spectacular colors, pink and orange, you know, that, that seem so amazing, that attract a lot of people, encourage a lot of people to think about um, the beauty of these mountains. But what I want you to think about is that the real diversity that we have here is not in wildflowers, it's in these other strange small creatures, salamanders being a prime example. We have more salamanders in the Southern Appalachians than anywhere else in the world. We also have mollusks and millipedes and mushrooms. Really fun job, but the M's kind of nice alliteration, right? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we have some of these species that are so diverse here in the region. So if we start with salamanders. Got a few different pictures for you here. The numbers keep shifting a little bit, so I said about 30 species here in the Southern Appalachians. It depends on who you talk to. And as I said, highest diversity in the world. Now, salamanders are a species that really require very clean water. Clean water, high humidity, a lot of rainfall. We meet all those criteria. And salamanders themselves are really ancient land animals. Now, that's going to matter when I talk to you in a few more minutes about why we have such diversity. So remember that salamanders like a lot of water, and they're ancient, because those two factors come into play. We have species, of course, that are endemic. Endemic means that they, are, they have highly restricted ranges. We also have very generalist species, red Fs being a generalist. You find those everywhere, all over the place. And then some of the neat ones, this little mountain dusky guy, belongs to the group that are called plethodontids. The plethodontids don't have lungs, and they don't have gills. So the way they breathe is actually across their moist skin. They must keep their skin moist in order to be able to absorb oxygen. Now that's really not so weird as it sounds, because if you think about how you absorb oxygen, your lungs are just infoldings of moist membranes. So you can get larger because you've got these infolded lungs. The salamanders stay small because they've just got the skin on their backs and bellies and legs to be able to take that oxygen up across that membrane. I listed mosses here too because in most of these pictures with salamanders you'll see mosses. The two things go together. And around here we have at least 500 different species and again that's one of those that kind of increases and decreases depending on who you talk to. 
We don't have the greatest number of mosses in the world, the tropics do, because they're warm and they're wet. They never freeze, so they don't damage any of the tissues. But we also get uh, really cool ones, hellbenders. Uh, that's one that, I, that my students are actually holding it that we collected out of Davidson River over in Transylvania County. This one that we collected was about 18 inches long. They get up to be, up, be about two and a half feet. They are the largest salamander in the United States. They're the second largest in the whole world. And the biggest salamander is called the Japanese giant salamander, which is a close relative of the hellbender. It's actually in the same group of salamanders. So second biggest guy in the whole world, salamanders. Now, excuse me. Yeah. The, the red seems to have lost his left back leg. Was he going back or is he just he's, going? he's just walking. What? It's tucked underneath. He's just walking. It's right there. Okay, yep. wonder, they, they don't. They don't. They do not. Mm -hmm. There are some salamanders that can, but they're mostly larval stage salamanders, and once they become this adult form, they're unable to grow those legs back. So the axolotls are probably best known as the salamanders that regrow limbs, but that's because they retain their larval characteristics through their whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. I know they're actually a different species. Mud puppies also get large, not quite that large, and mud puppies have gills. You can see the gills on the outside of them. Hellbenders are characterized not as having gills externally located. They've got all these folds of skin that increase surface area. Just like I was talking about lungs, your lungs that increase surface area. These can get bigger because they've got all this extra loose, floppy skin. They look really floppy when you pick them up. And that's, again, trying to increase the amount of oxygen that they can take up. because they bend the hell out of your rod when you catch them. <laughs> that works. <laughs> At least that's what the old fishermen tell me. Other salamander questions? Well, the Davidson, is that not one of the biggest populations? It is. There's a huge number of them in the Davidson River, and they've spread out into other areas. So we get them in a few. They have... I don't know that I believe it. My students say that Kings Creek, which runs right through the campus of Brevard College, that they've collected a, a hellbender out of it. I don't believe it because Photoshop works really easy to you know, put Brevard College on the bottom of the hellbender picture. Um, I haven't actually seen one there, and it's, it's kind of a small creek. They usually like larger bodies of water because they hide under big rocks, make a little cave underneath the rock, and that's where they'll lay their eggs. So I said salamanders, mushrooms, and mosses, and something else, millipedes, right, and mollusks. But mushrooms, one of those groups that's highly diverse in the southern Appalachians. As I've said, there are over 2,300 species identified. I just picked out a few of them to show you just because I couldn't resist, right? So anything that's called an elegant stinkhorn <laughs> just has to be put on a slide to show you, right? <laughs> It really does look like a little, kind of a little pink goat's horn that sticks up off the ground. It's about six inches tall. It stinks. The way you find stink horns is you smell them first and then you start looking for them. We have many different species of um, stink horns. They like to grow on mulched areas. So if you've got areas that have been mulched around the library, Transylvania County Library called me and said, we have got this god-awful smell out here. Can you figure out what it is? I said, stink horns, you got it on the mulch. You're done. Sorry, it's not going to go away. Can we go out there and pick them all and get rid of them? Yeah, but why? It's kind of neat to have stink horns coming up in your front lawn, I think. Uh, these are just fun little mushrooms, also really common around here. They're called bird's nest fungi, and they're also on mulch, and you can see how magnified this picture is because this is a chip of mulch, so you know about that big around. So the little, the little mushrooms themselves are small too, and they're shaped like cups. They're also sometimes called splash cups. These are packages of spores, and when the raindrop hits, it knocks them out. And that's how they're distributed, is actually by rainwater to distribute those spores. I forgot to tell you, the way that the spores are distributed on the stink horns is that they stink so much, they smell like carrion, and they attract beetles and flies. Those come and crawl all over them looking for the food source and then fly off somewhere else and take the spores with them. Uh, these little cute ones down here are puffballs and aspic. Those are very common puffball around the area. It really does look at this stage like they've got that aspic over the ham, you know, that you glaze the ham with. And then what they'll do is that that covering will kind of slough off 
and you'll see these little orange bits sliding off. Looks really disgusting for a while. Then the puffball starts to elongate and it starts to come up from the, from the ground. All the color is bleached out except for all puffballs have an opening at the top where the spores are released. That's the only place where the reddish orange color remains. And at, their, at, at that stage, they're called pretty lips because it looks like a little mouth with, with lips around it, and that's the puffballs come out. You know, little kids love to stab the puffballs and the spores come out and fly around everywhere. And that again disperses the spores. It doesn't necessarily have to only attract little kids or naturalists to do that. It can be raindrops that hit it or other objects that hit it. Um, large beetles, falling limbs, that all disperses spores. And then the top one, of course, I couldn't resist either the dog vomit slime mold, that is its actual name. Um, slime molds are really, if you want to get into the technical biology aspect of it, they're not, in fact, fungi, they're a protist group. But they look like fungi, and they, they, the cells all come together and they form this big, brightly colored plasmodium. That, this is a little washed out. They're usually bright yellow or even bright orange. They, they appear like that just for a day. They are slimy. If you touch them, they're, they're delicate and slimy. And then after about two more days, they start to produce their spores. They turn dark and harden off. I've had a lot of calls from people who say, oh my God, this, I'm having a dinner party and this stuff has just appeared all over the lawn. See how it's in the grass? <laughs> And I don't know how to get rid of it, so what I did was I took my hose and I sprayed it. <laughs> and I said, did you happen to spray it like up over your house and everything? Oh yeah, it's all over the place. I said, about two more weeks, you're gonna be in a big mess. <laughs> because all of that, you've just dispersed it, thankfully, you know, and it's gonna be everywhere coming up again. So the dog vomit slime mold, the bird's nest fungi, the elegant stinkhorn, all of those are, are species that you're gonna see locally because they really like to grow on degrading mulch and grasses and things like that. So once you've got them, I'm afraid you've got them. But then you can just talk about them being slime molds and elegant stinkhorns, right? <laughs> Question? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. you, you used a term I hadn't heard before, and I, don't, I may have misheard. Protist? That you said it wasn't a fungi, it was a protist? A protist, mm-hmm. What is a protist? All right, so I'm teaching biodiversity right now. And so the five kingdoms of life are bacteria. Well, let's go the opposite way because it's easier. Animals, plants, fungi, and bacteria, and protists. Protists are single-celled organisms which are closely related to, in fact, fungi and animals and plants more closely than they are to bacteria. But you don't get to see them because they're single-celled and you've got to have a microscope to see them. So the reason that that one is a protist is because it normally exists as an amoeba. You know, amoebas from high school biology, that's a protist. And that's how these, these, this organism normally exists as single-celled amoebas crawling throughout the, the mulch. And when they get starved, they all collect together and form this multicellular organism. So this is an, an, this is an organism, a protist, becomes a colony that interacts in a lot of first stage in the evolution of multicellularity. So it's going from a single cell, how do you get a single cell protist to form a fungus or an animal or a plant? And this is that, that first step in that evolution of life. How do you spell that word? I can't tell what you're saying. P-R-O-T-I-S-T. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have to come do um, biodiversity class next time, right? All the weird things. I always like teaching it at the very beginning of the class because we do all these weird things that, you know, they think they're taking biodiversity and you're going to learn about mammals. And I go, mammals. Mammals are boring. They're furry and they got four legs. You know how whatever else there is on Earth? I mean, it's just a, an incredible diversity of life among the animals, but also other kinds of life, too. Does the slime mold that you have pictured have any benefit it, uh, at all to the Earth? <laughs> I'm sure it does. I don't know what it is, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, those, especially those single cell forms of life, there's just, actually, okay, so this is a really weird aside, but I had this really, before I give talks, you know, you get a little anxious before you're giving a talk. So I had this dream last night that I was hiking and I was on this trail 
and there were these clouds that were over me. And as I looked up through the clouds, I could see these, these little legs that were moving through the clouds. And I realized that I was a very tiny organism living in a, in a bubble. And what I was looking at was the whole life of the rest of the earth above me. And it makes me wonder if that's true, <laughs> right? I mean, we think of these tiny little amoebas as being you know, these insignificant little things. We have no idea what that is doing on Earth. And I wonder if we have any idea what we're doing on Earth, frankly. It's another story for another time. We're destroying it as well. Yep, but wherever possible, we're trying to educate people about it, which might make a difference. Might is a key word. But that would be the only reason I'm still teaching, is because I think might make, might make a difference. So a lot of people know mushrooms too because of their edibility. So I picked out a few edible species. I actually just ate sulfur shelf. I got a few of these in my refrigerator right now. Um, I found some the other day. And sulfur shelf is very easy to identify because it's this bright orange color. It grows as shelves. And it's sulfur shelf because the underside of it is yellow. I mean bright yellow. It is also a mushroom that has pores instead of gills. So if you flip this and, and look at it underneath, it doesn't have gills like this little guy over here. It has these tiny series of pores. So it belongs to a group of the mushrooms called polypores that are generally pretty easy to identify. Cinnabar red chanterelles, that's one of several species of chanterelles that we have in the region. Also a very easy one to identify. And of course, morels that come up in the spring of the year. Uh, again, a, a species that's easy to identify. So if you eat mushrooms, you need to remember the old maxim. There are bold mushroom hunters and there are old <laughs> mushroom hunters. But there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. <laughs> so make sure you can identify your mushroom with 100% certainty and don't eat a species that has a close relative that's dangerous. So I feel certain that I can identify these, but I still don't eat really pretty white gilled mushrooms because there's also one that's called a destroying angel. It's so pretty, you take a bite of it and about three to four days later you wonder why you don't feel so good, your eyes start to turn yellow and then you realize it's because your liver no longer functions and you either get a liver transplant or die. I mean there are mushrooms that will kill you. There are other mushrooms that cause gastric distress. That's when you wish you were dead. Right? <laughs> so careful if you eat mushrooms. But there are some species and they are fantastic. And then there are some other fun ones that are fungal parasites. These are just two that I've picked out. Uh, Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, which are orange so they, and, and appear about this time of year, which I think is part of the reason they're called jack-o'-lanterns. The other thing though, and y'all are gonna learn about this, I think its next presenter is bioluminescence in fungi. This is a species that's bioluminescent. So that's one of my favorite ones to collect. You can pick it, take it into an absolutely dark room. I mean, it must be completely black. So what we do at my college is we go into the women's bathroom, <laughs> put a sign on the door. It's always fun to have 20 people, including about five guys, all packed together in the women's bathroom. And you actually have to turn away from the door because even the little rim of light that comes around the door will mess up your eyes. So stand there for a few minutes, let your eyes get adjusted to complete blackness, and then you will see that mushroom glowing this, this greenish color. We don't know why they glow, so I might have to come next time and find out why. But this species is one of them that does it. It is also parasitic on live trees. So this is a red oak that's been parasitized by this mushroom, and it eventually will succumb to that. Now, what you need to know about mushrooms is that the mushrooms are just the above ground part of the whole fungus that's down in the ground. The whole body of the fungus is called the mycelium, and it looks, it looks like strands of spaghetti almost, from hair-sized strands to spaghetti-sized strands. And that ramifies throughout the forest floor. That's the organism that's actually eating, it's consuming the nutrients that it's breaking down in that forest floor, breaking down the dead trees, or in this case live trees, taking those nutrients up into its body, and then when it's got enough nutrients and it's the right season of the year, it puts up mushrooms, really sort of the same way a tree makes flowers. 
So the seasonality of the mushrooms is related to the seasonality of its reproductive cycle. So like the morels that I showed in the last one, they only come up in the spring. They're in the you collect those. Uh, sulfur shelves are a little more generalized. They're this time of year. <clears throat> and uh, jack-o'-lanterns are really specific right about October when they start to bloom is a way of looking at it. So you can pick off these mushrooms as much as you want. It's not going to affect the fungus below there at all. Once you see those mushrooms, you've got the fungus in the soil. And that's the mechanism of circles. <clears throat> right. So the reason you see fairy circles is because what you're seeing reflected is the outermost edge of growth for that mushroom mycelium. The newest edges are the pieces that usually put up the fungal um, tips, and that's where the mushrooms come up from. So that's why they're going in a circle, because that's the, that's the newest growth around that rim. But it's all the way back to the middle of that circle. So the sulfur shell, is, it, is that you know, spaghetti in the tree then? It is. Mm -hmm. So if you break open the tree and look in there, you'll see white strands of tissue in there. And that's the, mus that's the fungus. It will eventually. It, it depends on the severity of the infection. So sometimes it will just weaken the tree. This tree that I've taken this picture of, that picture is about 10 years old. That tree is still there. It's probably going to be there another 20 or 30. But it's not as healthy as it might be. It's having some of its nutrients sucked away by this parasitic mushroom. This is a parasitic mushroom. There are other mushrooms that are, that are mutualistic mushrooms, which are actually helping trees. But that's a, another talk for mushrooms. You can do a whole thing on mushrooms. There's so much to learn about those. And don't eat the jack-o'-lanterns. Jack-o'-lanterns are poisonous. Yeah. That is correct. They cause gastric distress. Never try it out to figure out what that meant, but don't, not interested. <laughs> All right, and then this last picture that's over here, here you're looking again. If you imagine right here, this is the little mushroom that's growing up out of the ground, and it's uh, in a heavily mulched woodland area. So what I've done, once I saw that mushroom, is I dug away the soil at the base of it. So I just took my shovel and dug down into here and pulled that away so I could take this picture. So now what you're seeing, all right, if I scoot this over. Now what you're seeing, here's the mushroom, the above ground portion. You can trace it back and see all those white strands of tissue in there? That's all the mycelium through there. But when you get back here, there's this. Do you know what that is? You guys do. It's a beetle pupa, right? So what happened was there was a beetle grub that lived in the mulch, and it was crawling along through this mulch, and it hit a spore from this fungus. It ingested that spore, and instead of being digested, the spore just lodged in its intestinal tract. The beetle kept, grow kept chewing along, doing its own thing, and then when it was time to pupate, so it goes into the case, it makes itself a case, it transforms itself through metamorphosis from the larva into the adult form. But what happens, instead of that beetle coming out of the case, when the beetle grub pupates and begins that transition, it starts that spore to grow. And the spore starts to grow. It sends out all these little threads of tissue, and those threads of tissue start digesting the food source that it's in. What comes out of this pupil case is not a, a, a grub at all, or a grub or a beetle adult at all. What comes out is a mycelium that grows up and then releases more spores. So it's like super alien. So my next book I'm going to write is science fiction, except for it doesn't have to be fiction, right? And I realized as I was looking at all these mushrooms, just like every one of these mushrooms I've showed you is orange, right? I, I went to Clemson. I don't know what happened with that, but every, all of them, orange, orange and orange. Right. We also have a huge diversity of mollusk and millipedes, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, they just published a book, well, recently published a book, 20, 2006, over 140 species of land snails identified, which seems like an incredible diversity. We also have a lot of different millipedes, about 230 species identified so far. And they are being identified as part of that um, all taxa biodiversity inventory. I bet you guys have heard about this. You can go participate on a bug blitz where all the bugs that are collected are identified. And you've got a beetle blitz where you've got beetle biologists that are there. You can have a millipede blitz where you're trying to identify all the millipedes. If you really want to learn about different and weird groups, 
this ATBI is a fun thing to get involved in. You can find the ATB on the internet, sure. It's part of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park Survey. We also, you know, have a diversity of wood warblers. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh, so that depends. The most damage that I get in my garden is are from slugs, which are just snail shellless snails. The yellow ones that we have around here are a non-native species, so I happily take those and squish them because they're not native. But the little gray ones are natives, and I take those out and I drop them somewhere else. <laughs> so I'm probably, you guys are too, super weird about trying to keep natives happy, even if they're eating up my lettuce leaves and getting rid of non-natives wherever I can. So I try not to wholesale remove them from my garden. I try to hand pick them and plant twice as much lettuce as I actually need. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on wood whirlers. They're another like wildflowers, one of those big groups that a lot of people who are naturalists get into learning. They're so fun to try and identify. Uh, we have about 57 species here uh, locally, all of them overwinter in South America. And I just put two of my favorite ones that are up there, hooded warblers. They're a real specialist of rhododendron thickets. And they say, their call sounds like, we see, we see, we see you, we see you. And I always think that's, you can see those because they come down low into the thickets. And wood thrushes, I just think those are so pretty. They, when you hear those on a foggy morning, it sounds like a flute that's playing. It makes me think of the legend of Pan playing his flute through the forest. That's what I think of when I hear wood thrushes. So just picked out a couple of those. Oven birds, I love those too because they say teacher, teacher, teacher. So that's kind of fun. Teach, teach, teach. And trees and wildflowers, about 100 different tree species. In a cove, it's common to find 60. And just as a comparison, if you go to Great Britain, the whole country of Great Britain has 33 tree species. We have twice as many in a single cove and three times as many in the region. So our diversity of trees is pretty impressive. Our flower diversity, again, it's beautiful. We love those wildflowers. We have about 1,400 different flowering plants, but if you go to the tropics, they're gonna put us to shame. They have a lot more diversity, again, mainly because it's wet, but it's also warm. And since it doesn't freeze, we get a higher diversity there. So I've given you a little taste of why, or sorry, what the diversity is in all those areas. And now I wanna spend the last half of this talking about why we have such diversity. I won't give you a test on this, but here are the top five reasons. We're gonna look at these each in order. Rainfall being primary. The ancient mountains, I keyed you in on that before, hopefully. We're gonna talk, I'll show you some examples of microhabitats. How the mountain range itself is oriented has really influenced our diversity. And lastly, there, that absence of glaciation. So I'll spend a little time on each one of these. Uh, this is a picture from Looking Glass Falls in Transylvania County, so that's where I'm from. And Transylvania County styles itself as being the land of waterfalls. What the old, all the old timers, the same ones that tell you about hellbenders, what they tell you is that it ought to be called the land where water falls because it's so much of it coming down. We have uh, the average, there's 86 inches of rain per year. We've had several years where it's been over 100. And an average of 100 is what qualifies you as a rainforest. So Transylvania County is right on the border of being called a temperate rainforest because we have that as our level of rain on average per year. And the reason that rain matters is because water is life. We're looking for water on Mars. We're looking for water on the moons of Saturn and Jupiter because every kind of organism that we understand has to have water to survive. So we're assuming that if we can find water in other places in the universe that we may find life there as well. Plants have to have water. And the more plants that you have, the more animal diversity that can be supported too. So waterfall is the primary reason for why we get this diversity in this region. And all that rain is good for something. The fact that the mountains are very ancient, it also contributes too, though. So the Southern Appalachians in the most recent mountain building episode, most recent, was 330 million years ago. Right, 330 million years. 
Evolution acts over these long geological periods of time. So if you think about that stability, that these mountains have been here for so long, flowering plants have only been around about 65 million years. Those pink lady slippers orchids, they, were, they evolved, they first opened up the first flowers to the sun in these mountains when the mountains were already old. They were already 200 million years old. And those plants are only 65 million years old. So very ancient animals and plants, salamanders being a good example, salamanders and club mosses have been on Earth about 300 million years. So the mountains were about 330 million years old. So during that whole period of time, again, they're supporting that life. So it's the stability, the ancient age of these mountains that really give rise to protecting species as a refuge, and then for newer species being able to find new niches. So we get both ends of the spectrum on that. Microhabitats, micro, small places that are habitats for different species. And if we just look in an area around Transylvania County, so these are three different microhabitats in my little bitty Transylvania County. Uh, these are mountain sweet pitcher plants, which are in a bog in Transylvania County. They are a federally endangered species because they're so rare. There aren't very many mountain bogs, and those species occur there. Wolf Mountain Overlook up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. This is one of my favorite places. If you ever drive on the parkway, stop at the Wolf Mountain Overlook. It's this, a road cut that is a big granite face that has water constantly running over it. Water is life. And when you get there, you'll see these are sundews that are occurring. You can see how wet that is. This is the granite rock, and there's a sundew. August is the best time to go because then the orchids are blooming. There are native orchid species. There's grass of Parnassus. There are all these other re weird and rare plants that you can find there because you've got a different sort of habitat that's available. When you get up on different areas on the parkway, you find these bald. They're going to support gray's lily and some other really interesting plants that have to have a sunny, open, meadow-like area. If you've got a meadow that's adjacent to the forest, Bar Babs and I were talking about this earlier, then you have a diversity of species there. So these microhabitats support different species. And I want to focus a little bit on that mountain sweet pitcher plant the reason that, that species diversities matter is because you, by, by supporting one species, you actually increase the other number of species that depend upon it. This is a mountain sweet pitcher plant. Those are the leaves of the plant that are rolled up into a tube, and they fold over at the top. Now, since the leaves are upright instead of splayed out, they're not very efficient at gathering sunlight but they're able to grow in areas that are boggy where other plants can't grow because there's not enough nutrients. The way they acquire their nutrients is by trapping insects and digesting those insect bodies. So what I did was I took one of those leaves and I cut it with a knife down to the bottom. So this is that bottom of the leaf cut open. And what you see is that it's packed with insects and I pulled them all out and started identifying them. And what I found was about 95% of the animals that were in here were wasps and yellow jackets. Those were what were being attracted to that edge. They land on the edge. The edge has a rim of nectar around it. And at the very top, in the top of that tube, there are hairs that point downwards. So the insect lands on there, it kind of leans over because it smells good to get that nectar, and then it hits those downward pointing hairs and just boom, all the way to the bottom. And it can't, because it's so, uh, such a long tube, it can't fly back out. So they struggle around in there until they die, and then they start to decompose. The plant is able to take the nutrients up over its leaf. So if you've got house plants and you water them on the leaves, they'll take up nutrients across the leaves. The same thing these are able to do too. So question here and then back there. I'm coming to that. That is a great question I don't know the answer to. You'd have to really do a study on that to figure out how long it would take for a yellow jacket that fell in there to be digested. I don't know. It'd be an interesting study, though. So the pitcher plant, when the, 
goes in there, it's not an active thing, it doesn't close. Nope. It's stuck because of the hairs. That's correct. They could theoretically fly back out, but yellow jacks are big and heavy. It's hard for them to get up enough oomph to get moving. And so to have a narrow little tube like that, they just can't get going straight up and get out of there. Use bacterial decay for digestion or do they have some kind of digestion? It's mostly bacterial decay. There's a lot of interest among botanists at trying to figure out what level there are enzymes that are released by the plant to help break that down. There's not a lot of clarity on this one because it has that little slit over the top to prevent rainwater from getting in there. The thought is that if you get too much water, that it would dilute those digestive enzymes and the, and the bacteria too. So in this species, we think there are digestive enzymes as well as bacteria playing a role in the breakdown. But, and that's again kind of back to the question of how long do they persist. If we had more information on that, we'd have a better idea of how rapidly are they decomposing. That's going to tell us more about what's doing the decom decomposition. All right, but I haven't told you about these over here. They're also a pitcher plant, and they look different, right? Primarily, they don't have that little lid over the top, and they're kind of short, fat little containers. So they don't have the lid over the top. You can actually see, though, right there on the edge, you can also see those little teeth. Can you just barely, can you imagine that? <laughs> you can imagine it, right? You kind of see those little teeth around the edge. They're white, look like cactus spines almost. Um, but in any case, so it's full of water, right? Looks different. And if you look on the surface of those cup, uh, cups, these two probably being the best, there are actually insects that are there and they're moths. They're moths that have gotten their wings stuck in the surface tension and then can't get away. So they eventually will sink down to the bottom and die and decompose. Since there's so much more water in there, there isn't um, a concentrated slew of digestive enzymes. There's just an open container of water. And so what you get are species of midges that lay their eggs in this pitcher plant. And this species of midge only occurs in this species of pitcher plant. So midges are like non-biting mosquitoes. They don't bite. And that's the only place you can find them. So if you have a bog, which is being maintained by sphagnum moss throughout the area, that moss is going to set up the ability of these pitcher plants to come in and get established. And if you've got the pitcher plants, then you're going to have the midges that only occur in those pitcher plants. And then if you've got midges that are flying over a bog, you're going to get bats that are coming in to take up the midges. And you can see how it just keeps expanding on itself, right? So that's why a microhabitat matters for diversity. You get one species starting that, and then there's an explosion on the numbers of diversity. The north-south orientation of the mountains matters too. So we run that uh, direction is kind of north-south. And what that means is that as the seasons change and as climate changes, that species can move to the north and the south along that mountain range. If it were east and west going across this way, you'd really block your migration, which is exactly what the Himalayas do. On one side of the Himalayas is completely different from the other side because things can't get over that top. This also traps weather patterns, right? You're seeing that with the hurricanes that are coming through, right? If they come in on this side, they get deflected and move north. If they come in on this side, they get deflected and move north, but they don't usually cross this boundary. It also means that when we have weather fronts coming in from the northwest, these come sweeping down in the wintertime, and what they do is they blow right across the heartland of the United States, really our industrial center around Detroit area, pick up all the pollution from there, and bam it right into the mountains. It can't get over until it starts to drop some of the heavy rain that those clouds are containing. And if you're dropping off rain, you're also dropping off pollutants. So one of the reasons that we have such problems with, especially acid precipitation of southern Appalachians, we're producing some of it ourselves, but we also have just the orientation of our mountains. We trap those pollutants here before that can move north. Biologically speaking, it's a really important migration route for wood warblers, for monarch butterflies, for other species. They can track, say they like to be at 2,000 feet. They can go at 2,000 feet from practically Florida all the way up to Maine. And they can come back down when they're trying to move back. 
So we've got this orientation really acts like a, a funnel to move those migratory species back and forth. And glaciation. You, yeah. You mentioned acid rain, and I haven't heard much talk about it in a few years. Mm -hmm. and I assume it was because less coal fired, less oil fired, lower sulfur. Lower sulfur. Mm -hmm. And so is, is it still the issue? It's still a problem. The problem now is that although we have uh, better burning coal plants, so we still have coal plants and we burn um, higher quality coal, we also burn more of it because our population has increased. So that's really what's producing all our electricity is still based in coal fire. So we still have problems with acid rain. There, um, there's a lot more work that's being done on it now to try and mitigate some of those problems. But it's a mitigation. It's an expensive mitigation to try and minimize that. They don't use oil in power anymore. It's cold, yeah. primarily cold. Well, they're mm -hmm. converting to natural gas. Mm -hmm. And that's true, too. Natural gas is much cleaner than coal. So that's the interest in there, but then you got to frack it to get it out. So you got the other side of that. Yeah. So there's not, a, there's not a clean solution. There is a way to minimize effects, but not eliminate effects. So glaciation, what I'm going to tell you about the difference between the northern Appalachians and the southern Appalachians, they actually have a distinct line of demarcation, and that's the area at which glaciers extended. The southern Appalachians were never glaciated. So that last big glacial push, push which was about 10,000 years ago, it drove organisms to the south. And then as the glaciers retreated, they went from the south back towards the north. So you often hear, and I'm guilty of this myself, botanists and things saying, well, we're the southern extent of the boreal forest of spruce fir trees, right? Because you go to Canada and everything up there is spruce and fir trees. Well, guess what? They all came from here. This is the point from which that area was revegetated because that was scraped clean. There was a mile of ice on top of those areas. There were no plants. So we're the point, we're the, the cradle from which the rest of the area has been revegetated all the way up into the Ohio River Valley. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the things that's protected biodiversity in this region is that historically we've had a very low human population. It's hard to get into the mountains. And that area discouraged human occupation for a long period of time. We get farming in the valleys, you get some hunting on the ridges, you get some tree harvest, but all of that is recoverable. All of that depends on the biodiversity to restore itself. Mining, which is really disturbing of an ecosystem, is mostly located in the central Appalachians. We are blessed not to have all those coal and gas reserves. And that's prevented us from really being disturbed in, a, in an ecological sense in a way that can't be replaced. Farming and hunting and tree harvest is replaceable, right? Anything from Maryland down was not glaciated. So Maryland is about the point at which that, that line falls. It could be cold, but not a glacier. And a glacier is a, is a thick layer of ice. Right? So if you want to preserve all that wonderful biodiversity that I've been talking about, what do you need to be considering? And that's really about trying to protect areas of high species diversity. And you all are sitting in an area of high species diversity, so congratulations. You are doing what needs to be done to protect this region so that we can maintain our biodiversity. A lot of people know about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. That's an area that's called an International Biosphere Preserve. That is on par with Australia's Great Barrier Reef. We have the level of diversity of Australia's Great Barrier Reef right here. Now, we don't have great white sharks cruising around, so it's kind of not as dramatic. But we have those little killer millipedes and amoebas and salamanders and all those things. We've got the small things. And the small things get overlooked because they're not as charismatic as the big things. But the small things are really what's important. That's really what's supporting all that different kind of diversity. So continue to think about uh, diversity of habitats that need protection. Some of those different microhabitats that I talked about, bogs and other areas. Some uh, larger areas that have a lot of inputs into them, rivers being a great example. 
a river has to be protected from its source to its mouth because if you've got one person at the source contaminating the river, that's going to affect everybody who's downstream. Thinking about corridors for migration, this is something that people in the West have really considered because they've got grizzly bears, which are kind of big. They need a lot of room to be able to move around, and so they talk about migration corridors for grizzly bears. Nobody talks about migration corridors for salamanders. But we need to think about that. So think about this region. So here, this is a picture from a book of the southern Appalachian region. These are areas that have already been preserved, these darkened areas that are in here as national forest. There's a national park here, Great Smoky Mountains National Park here, uh, Shenandoah National Park up there, and the Parkway, Blue Ridge Parkway that connects them. We've got this land already preserved. If we can continue to link together these areas through conservancies such as yours, then we allow for those species to migrate as climate change drives them back north again. So salamanders can't get across a six-lane highway. Seeds that are blown from a bog of a pitcher plant can't travel very far. So we need those linkages of land from place to place to place to connect that corridor and build that corridor. And so that's what I would really encourage you all, you're doing it now, but to continue to think about how can you link up the land you've got here with other parcels that will allow that movement of species. Question, Babs? Well, Okay. And one of his points was that, uh, you know, you can take the plant and take the plant up and move it because the plant can't move as fast as climate change is going. Correct. The problem is that plant might be pollinated by an ant. Yep. And the ant can't move fast either. Yep. So and it's got a connection with the fungi that are in the soil, and you can't move those either. Right. So exactly, to try and maintain areas so that we can have that continuity. I think that that's, that's an important piece that we're missing that we need to think about, is that continuity that's needed for small things. Again, the small things matter. And that's what we have here in the East. All right, so I've got a few more slides to show you because I, uh, in addition to talking about biodiversity in the Southern Appalachians, the first biodiversity that I really studied was biodiversity in the sea. So the PhD that I earned in zoology was on sea cucumbers. You know little tiny sea cucumbers? You guys know those things? That's what I really worked on for my PhD. And it turns out that biodiversity in the sea is really what attracted me in the first place. There's so much diversity. That's where life originated, and it still contains all the major groups of animals. It's really different from the animals that are here in the southern Appalachians. And as it turns out, there are factors that influence that marine diversity that really is still the same idea as the factors I talked about with you. So what did I say was number one? Water, right? <laughs> Water in the ocean. We got it. And it's even salty, which is a good thing. It's the salinity of your cells. So individual cells have an easier time living in salt water than they do in fresh water. Uh, the number two thing that I said, can you remember what number two was? First was, first was rainfall. Microhabitats, microhabitats being really important. You also see that in the sea. You have the species that live on rocky shores, species that live on sandy shores, species that live in high levels of current, species that live in low areas of current. So there are all these different microhabitats that interact again. Thermal vents. What's that? Thermal vents. Thermal vents, absolutely. One of those other top three, do you remember another one of those? Yeah, you can look up there if you want to see it. <laughs> that stability, that concept of stability, being able to support diversity. The ancient mountains is how I phrase it, that our mountains are so old. Well, the oceans are older still, but they're also very stable. right? The reason that you don't have a lot of temperature changes if you live right along the coast is because you have this huge body of water that helps mitigate temperature change or salinity change or seawater change, all of those different things, they don't change very much. So those three things live, work together. Now I also said orientation of the mountain range and we can't really address that here, right? And then what was the last one? Glaciation. Can't really address that either in the sea. But the other three big ones really do matter in the sea just as they do here. So I'm known for my mountain nature book, but I also published a book about coastal natural history. 
and which is called Waterways Sailing the Southeastern Coast. And what I did, uh, as I said, for years, my husband and I um, traveled along the coast in a sailboat. And so I kept journals and I wrote a story about traveling from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, going on the intracoastal waterway down to Florida, then across over to West End in the Bahamas, and then back up offshore into, I think we came in at St. Augustine and then up in, in Beaufort, South Carolina. And so I wrote a story about that, but I got very interested as I was studying there about how biodiversity had changed. So I learned about Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson did a huge amount of work on the sea even though she's known for Silent Spring. She was actually a marine biologist. So I was sort of following in her footsteps there. I began to study about the different changes in the fish populations, changes in the salt marshes. I got very curious about all these different things. And I was really studying that along that southeastern coast and trying to make sense of that and write it up in this book too. So it's really the way I tried to describe it is as a single journey of learning how to see the area we were traveling in as we were learning how to sail our sailboat. So I called it learning to see, <laughs> but the publisher changed it. And I got curious, as I said, about southeastern diversity changing. Initially, just I was focused on plants and animals, but I quickly began to realize that all these names in the southeast, Edisto Island and Kiwi and all these different names, they're all derived from the native people who live there. Those people are mostly gone. There are a few that are persisting, but they were the first people to meet the first Spanish explorers, the first English explorers, and so their numbers really declined dramatically. But as I became interested in that, I ended up with a new book that I just published that is focused on the change in the native population of the southeast. And so this book is called The Legend of Skyco Spirit Quest. Again, the publisher chose the Spirit Quest part, which I really didn't like, but I like The Legend of Skyco, so I was good with that. And it's um, a historical fiction book because you have to imagine what it would have been like here before Europeans arrived. And that's how I constructed it. I wrote a book about what I thought, based on my knowledge as a biologist, what it would have been like to have grown up in the southeast as a Native American person. As it turns out, the boy Skyco uh, was a real person. He's recorded in some of the earliest English documentation. And he was kidnapped by the first English who came to North Carolina. The first English settlement was on Roanoke Island in North Carolina. They kidnapped him so that they had a hostage to make sure they got food from the surrounding tribes. As it turns out, he became the conduit to teach them the Algonquin language. He showed them different places and different food, and they ended up appreciating him and releasing him from their captivity after a while. So I thought that was just a story that needed to be told, and so I tried it. So I've got now three different books, and I brought them with me if you're interested in any of those. They actually all do go together, even though when I first start talking about Jennifer Frick, you're the person who wrote that biodiversity book. What are you writing one about Native American history on, right? How did that come together? They actually all do link, and that's, I kind of tried to tell you a little bit at least of that story of how those all come together.